Aloha, this is Josh Green. Welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host today. We've had an extraordinary breadth of conversations on this show over the last year or so. Today I bring back uh, one of my favorite people, Lola Irvin from Department of Health. She's got a master's degree and has a really a wide range of expertise in health policy. She's been a fixture at the state capitol for years in my capacity as a rep and a senator now. So she's always kind of a go-to person in my book. Welcome. Thank you. Good to see Good you, Good to be here. So uh, we know each other very well, but why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself, Lola, your background and your interest in which kind of health policy things okay. you're most interested in. Okay. Um, my early training came from the American Cancer Society, which is pretty exciting because we got to work on prevention as well as early detection and treatment and quality of life. Um, so that led me into the Department of Health working on public health issues. And so I worked on school health for a while, which is nice because it's primary prevention. And then I got to um, be involved with the Tobacco Summit Special Fund, the Health UI Initiative, and got to know you um, as a champion for primary prevention. Yeah, so you've really been involved right from uh, kind of the beginning of all these major programs. And we've seen results. One of the nice things about uh, what you do is we've begun to really see the, the fruits of your labors start playing out in the public health sphere. A lot of people move to different areas and move to different disciplines and careers, and I think they may never get to see the results. But today, I think we'll have a chance to talk about some of the actual results from all this hard work. So we've called our show um, Health Policy Trends in Our Nation today, and you know so much about many of these issues, whether it's tobacco and cancer prevention. Uh, you work on the Obesity Task Force. You're one of the leaders there. Uh, you've become an expert on other issues like e-cigs, but why don't I give you an open-ended question to start. Tell us a little bit about the trends. What are you seeing as far as policy goes uh, it, trending in the United States uh, in other legislatures or in other departments of health? What are the hot topics? Okay, one hot topic in the area of tobacco is e-cigarette legislation, so electronic smoking device as we're calling it um, yes. in our um, bill. Um, and that is actually one of the Gov's bills, and so we're really thrilled um, for the support we're getting from Senate and House on that. But nationally, there's a recognition that the use of e-cigarettes has the potential of eroding smoke-free laws for states that do have it. Um, nationally, the youth are taking it up very quickly. Now in Hawaii, compared to the rest of the nation, our youth are using it at a higher rate for middle school and high school. Right. Our youth are using it at a high rate. So anyway, that is one of the national policies um, that's moving forward across states. And um, the advice we got actually from our Centers for Disease Control experts was, don't wait on us. Don't wait on the federal government for regulations. Go protect your children and youth. And so we've come to the legislature to say, let's do that. Let's do that in Hawaii. Let me unpack that a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, to take a half step back, uh, your efforts have been successful on tobacco. And now some of that's going to, I think, get translated on e-cigs. Now, over the last several years, you've told me that um, policy work to make tobacco more expensive through taxes, mm -hmm. uh, to make tobacco more difficult to smoke by having smoke-free workplaces and smoke-free restaurants and so on, has helped all contribute to decreasing uh, young people, especially smoking, and adults. Mm -hmm. So give us a little bit of the statistics on that so people can understand what you did with tobacco, and now what maybe the pro, you know the uh, progressive policy recommendations will be on e-cigs. So what's happened? Okay, I am so glad you asked, yes. because in terms of what's happened is um, for youth smoking from 2001 to 2013, we've had a 63 percent reduction. Wow! So we went from a time when almost one out of three of our youth reported they were smoking cigarettes to now it's about one in ten. And this matters because then we don't have adult smokers who don't get lung cancer, COPD, mm. chronic asthma exacerbations, more pneumonia, all those things, right? right? And now they're seeing a connection to diabetes. Oh my goodness. And so in terms of risk for diabetes, smoking now they found is a risk for diabetes, um, along with all of the heart disease and stroke issues. Um, so yes, we're preventing that with our youth, healthier future. Now for our adults, we've seen similar declines. And so um, we came from a time um, of about one in five of our adults smoked when we started in 2000. So from about 2000 to 2013, mm -hmm. we've had a 32% reduction. That's incredibly good. Yeah, we have um, the third lowest smoking rate, so which is fantastic. What other states could possibly have lower rates? I'm curious. Utah and California. <laughs> wow, interesting. So Utah is very socially conservative yes. and health conscious, and California very health conscious. Yes. And 
Yeah, okay, interesting. But it's great. It's nice to be ranked in the top three mm -hmm. in, in an indicator like this. Okay, so we've had a lot of success on tobacco, and we've seen rates of smoking dwindle. We've seen fewer adolescents smoking. But we're not seeing that with e-cigs, as you pointed out. Right. You, got, you kind of blew my mind in a hearing recently when um, you presented some of the data from the Cancer Research Center, which I, by the way, think does a lot of great work. Mm -hmm. And y I, tell me those numbers again, because I can't recall them directly from here. It wasn't like 300% increase in, right. in some so of our schools. What kids? we saw with the Youth Tobacco Survey was there was a quadrupling of um, e-cigarette use with middle school students from 2011 to 2013. Okay. And then for high school students in the same time period, it tripled. Man. Uh, so we see, our, we see a quick adoption of these products with our youth. And why, why is that? First of all, e-cigs, OK? These are devices, they're electronic devices where people um, put nicotine in, typically, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And though the market has said it's not favoring marketing to young people, that doesn't seem to be what I'm seeing, because I go to the mall and I see e-cigs being sold and I and I smell um, flavored vapor mm -hmm. and I would assume that that's a candy connection and they're targeting young people. Right. I mean they have flavors like bubble gum and um, yeah, yeah candy flavors, um, can, uh, cake. Um, so and, and then of course in terms of then the technology is really intriguing to yes. our young people because then they can buy component parts and put it together. Yes. Um, there's also cloud chasing um, where on YouTube um, they actually have competition in terms of people who blow the um, aerosolizing of the, you know, the solvents and things. Yes. And then they make clouds and cloud shapes. And so you can find that on YouTube. Um, wow. So we are really concerned because we cannot tell people that that's a healthier alternative. Right. Um, the best thing to do is not smoke. Yes. Well, let me, let me break this down a little bit too. Okay, so we went into the dialogue about E6, right? Mm -hmm. And I, at first, um, the proponents of e-cigs were making what appears to be now a specious claim and they were saying look use e-cigs they're not as bad as traditional cigarettes they will help you quit mm -hmm. and then research came out right right break that down for me a little bit what's the research showing on cessation on use because i'm very worried about this number that a tripling or a quadrupling of individuals getting addicted to nicotine mm -hmm. which last time i checked as a physician was a toxin right. so okay so now we've got a bunch of teenagers and middle schoolers getting addicted to nicotine. They obviously weren't getting off of cigarettes. Right. So what's going on? Yeah, that's you make such a great case because what's happening too is, um, and that's the cancer center's data, is um, youth who use e-cigarettes yes. are reporting that they're more likely to then to transition to cigarettes. Um, so that's really a concern for us. The other thing is in terms of, um, I mean, when you have a brand called Smoke Anywhere, yeah. Um, that's not quitting. Right. Um, so it is not a f FDA approved cessation tool. It's okay. not approved. Um, and there are other approved methods for quitting smoking. Um, with our youth, when they take it up, um, these things also are used to create a sense of community. You can go online and see Blue Nation. Yes. So with the blue cigarettes, you know, have a sense of belonging. A lot of the same practices that tobacco industry used. Right. They're using for e-cigs. And it worked with the youth then, it's working with the youth now. Only then we weren't engaged, right, because we weren't regulating and we weren't focused. And mm -hmm. I also noticed that a lot of the major national and international uh, cigarette companies are buying up mm -hmm. the e-cig companies. So it's really just new names, same old faces. Yes. Okay, so now we have this surge of mm -hmm. e-smoking or uh, vaping and a new generation addicted to nicotine. What are we going to do? What are the best policy recommendations nationally? What are the recommendations from uh, you and Governor Ige? W what should we do? Okay, so there is a governor's bill, HB 940, and I know Senate has also um, yes. as companion. And it is to include e-cigarettes in the laws. Wherever smoking is not allowed, then e-cigarette use will not be allowed. Got it. And that bill was originally, in terms of when we think about smoking, it was a workplace protection. Yes. Right, it's because people who work in places where there was smoking of cigarettes didn't have the option. They needed those jobs, mm -hmm. um, or their children. They yes. didn't have the option, but to be in those environments. And so, likewise, we'll protect people from e-cigarettes. Got it. Okay. So the premise then, I guess, is that 
once again, people can make their own decisions, yes. but not where they're uh, imposing their lifestyle on another, which is to say blowing vape, vaporized um, nicotine into their face or disrupting the workplace or what have mm -hmm. you. And we expect that to further decrease the consumption at the workplace and so yes. on. What are we going to do about the kids, though? How do, we, how do we dissuade young people from just getting addicted to this stimulant? How do we reverse this trend on the three and four hundred percent increase of um, e cigs Okay, so the other thing that's happening is there's a bill that would um, increase the age of sales of tobacco okay. up to 21. Yes. And that would include e-cigarettes. Got it. Since 90 percent of people who smoke started before they were 21. Right. And so um, we would include wow. e-cigarettes in that, yeah. Got it. Yeah, I heard, and, and disavow me of this uh, myth if it's not correct, but I heard that one of the reasons that it's a problem uh, in the adolescent category is because since you can have an 18 year old buy your e-cigarette for you everyone in high school has a friend it used to the old thing was beer you know you'd have your 18 year old or or whatever friend go out and buy you alcohol but now uh, in the high school setting they can always have some friend who's 18 or looks 18 they can mm -hmm. get them an e-cigarette device or they can get it online I assume mm -hmm. right and next thing you know they're getting the the uh, nicotine and so on. So is so is that the goal? So we make it to 21, so the cohort of young people doesn't mix. The 16, 15 year olds don't often mix with 21, 22 right. year olds. Sales will go down. And we also want to delay experimentation, right? Until a point when they can make a better decision. Right. Because when we think in terms of a 15 or 16 year old up against multi-million dollar marketing campaigns, right. boy, that's not a win-win proposition for our teenagers. And so we want to give them a little bit more buffer time yeah. because of the marketing that's being, you know, pointed towards them. Right. Um, price point is another, and that's been well used. In How much do these things cost? I don't have any. Oh, they range anywhere from um, eight to three hundred to five hundred dollars. By the time you put all wow. the components together, so they can look like the pen that you're holding and be really slim mm -hmm. and inexpensive, and they're disposable. Yes. Or they're reusable in the big tank model. Amazing, and yeah, we do know that price points on anything will dissuade mm -hmm. young people if they don't have a lot of free cash. And then I'm worried about the actual juice or the nicotine right, that the goes e into mm -hmm. So, so far it's not really regulated. No, is that it's correct? not regulated at all. So how do we know that people, this again is the physician in me, how do we know that um, old or young people aren't having a contaminated product that they're inhaling and they're mm -hmm. not going to get strange infections in their lungs, fungal infections, bacterial infections, what's the concentration? I mean, how do we know right. any of these things? We don't know. We don't know. And so even when people do say, well, you know, um, it has flavorings, I've mixed the flavorings, and these flavorings are FDA approved, those are approved for consumption, yes. right? not for inhalation. Um, the other thing that in terms of in public health, what's emitted, yes. we don't use the word vapor, we say aerosolized, because uh -huh. those are solvents that yes. are going into the air. And um, the American Society of Heating Engineers heating air conditioning engineers, ASHRAE. Yes. Um, but Offerman um, in an article said, you know, they're more micron particulates. It's better to look at it that way because these chemicals are being aerosolized into the air. Um, so solvents um, like, um, okay, antifreeze. It's yes. um, propylene glyco. Yes. When they're heated, they um, turn into formal formaldehyde and other toxic and car carcinogenic, um, carcinogenic uh, chemicals. And so, it's dangerous. Yeah. It's dangerous what people are heating up and inhaling um, so that they can get the high from the nicotine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's... And then in terms of the concentration, um, calls to um, poison control nationally have gone up, you know, 400%, 500%. Um, there was one child um, that died um, from ingesting it. Uh, because a teaspoon will poison a child, right? right? And so we're thinking of these little containers that are not regulated and that people can mix at home they're not in childproof packaging. That's also still not regulated. So we need to do that. So really, I guess uh, before we take our first break, I would just say parents at home, please be very careful and think twice. Uh, we don't know how e-cigs are going to affect your health very well yet. There doesn't seem to be any redeeming quality to them, except uh, we do know to warn you, you will be addicted to nicotine and that's going to be a problem going forward. But be particularly mindful of uh, the substance in there. Don't let your kids anywhere near it because it's going to do them harm. Okay, so we're going to take a break now. Uh, in our first 15 minutes, I think you've done an excellent job laying out some of the policy uh, 
priorities on e-cigs. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the Obesity Prevention Task Force and what's going on in that field of study and policy in America. I'm Josh Green, your host of Healthcare in Hawaii. We're here with Hunter Haviland because he is a member of our panel on uh, February 26th. We're going to talk about Hawaii, the state of um, unfunded liabilities. Hi, Hunter. Hi, Jay. So what does it look like from your point of view, being on that panel? Uh, well, part of my work is uh, with the uh, Asia Pacific Center for Regenerative Design. And so with that, we're kind of taking a broader notion of when we talk about liabilities, what are some of the external factors, right? So if we're talking about sustainability across the globe, resilience to natural disasters, um, our use of natural resources, and how those things do or don't um, get incorporated into our current understandings of the state of the state. Yeah, and thus the liabilities and thus the economy. Yeah. So that's uh, February 26th. It's uh, Thursday. It's at Lani Akea. It starts at uh, 12 noon. Come down 11.30 for lunch. Uh, check out our website to sign up, thinktechhawaii.com. Hunter is one of seven speakers. We'll be trying to talk to some of the others, too, let you know what they're going to do. And uh, sign up. We'll see you there. It'll be important. It's one of the most important things we can think of. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, State Senator from the Big Island ER position. Today I'm joined by a good friend, Lola Irvin, who's a, a Department of Health leader. She works on public health matters, and she's able to bring uh, health priorities from across many states, health policy initiatives that are emerging, uh, not just here, but in all the different corners of our country to give us best health policy practices to consider. In our first 15 minutes of our show today, she spoke eloquently about e-cigarettes and the things we need to do, as we've seen a three to 400 percent increase, three to four fold increase in adolescent use of e-cigs. This is very disconcerting because young people are becoming addicted to nicotine, and we know what will follow. They will become smokers probably, and if not, we still don't even know the negative effects of e-cigs. So we're going to be very careful. The next thing we want to do, though, is we want to have a conversation, because she's an expert, about obesity. Now, the Obesity Prevention Task Force has been going on now for a couple years. Yes. Uh, why don't you give us an update, Lola, on what's come from the task force, what we're seeing as national trends on obesity, uh, just really what the emerging good ideas on health policy are in this field. Okay. We're really excited because when the Obesity Prevention Task Force started under um, Director Fuddy, um, yeah, our friend... Um, you know, we were relying on the Institutes of Medicine and the Centers for Disease Control and um, just really new recommendations that came out from IOM sure. um, that looked at really working at policies from a socio-ecological perspective. And the media was actually um, considered one of the environments mm -hmm. that we move and breathe in, um, along with then um, our community institutional policy as well as legislative policy that determines our um, options in life. as. We're, we're, where we work, live, and play. Sure. Um, since that time, this month, um, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee has come out with their 2015 recommendations. And so now it's open for public comments. Yes. It's the first time ever that the um, federal government is actually recommending a guideline for um, sugar percentage in our daily diet. Interesting. And so they're recommending 10%. Um, and recommending that Americans need to reduce their intake of added sugars. This is something that the Obesity Prevention Task Force had, you know, worked on to say, you know, how do we make it so that people understand the dangers of all these added sugars, right. especially in beverage, right. um, but also then to work towards making then the healthy foods the more obvious, the default, make it more available. Sure. Um, so some of the recommendations that came out was, well, we need to work on um, things like this year, um, the Hawaii Public Health Institute came forward uh, with the Obesity Prevention Task Force to say, what about uh, warning labels? Yes. California tried it. Got a little farther than we did this yeah. year. But um, so maybe the public needs to know um, if we put warning labels like we have on cigarettes, yes. maybe it'll um, encourage a little bit more thought before people consume the sugar beverage. And this, and this harkens back to past discussions that we've had because I think what you're, you, we almost take for granted between us, but 
we've seen an incredible surge in diabetes. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a huge surge in adult and childhood obesity in the last, say, what, 10, 15 years, right? right? So now we're seeing young diabetics and kids with hypertension, high blood pressure. We're seeing all these problems because of obesity. Uh, it's my understanding that we spent in the United States last year $300 billion on diabetes alone. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, billions and billions of dollars of preventable health care mm -hmm. costs if we can practice, you know, good prevention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, good personal responsibility, but also now being mindful. These are the recommendations, right, here yes, on the table. Yes. Um, being mindful of the amount of sugar that we mm -hmm. add. Uh, if I'm correct, 6% of the average American's calories come from sodas mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. which I've heard you say very eloquently many times are, and I don't think that you pick on the soda companies indiscriminately, but they're empty calories, right? right. People make their choices. You know, everyone likes Pepsi or Coke periodically, but mm -hmm. these 6% of your calories contribute, along with everything else, to this added sugar, which now the feds are saying, don't do. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the thing is, we don't compensate for it. Right. So if we take in 200, 250 calories yes. from that drink, we don't feel full. Right. So we'll eat another 200, 250 mm -hmm. calories. Right. Now we've got 500 calories. Yes. And that on a daily basis is going to add up and accumulate on our bodies. Yeah. And that contributes to the diabetes risk, the overweight, obesity risks. Yes. Well, I, just so people know, if you do drink... 140 calories of a soda per day extra in addition to everything else that's about a pound and a half a month that mm -hmm. you'll gain which is about 15 pounds a year plus mm -hmm. and we see a lot i mean i see, when i'm in the hospital i see a lot of teenagers going from age 12 to 13 to 14 and when you see these kids going bumping up 15 pounds a year and i'm not just saying it's from soda i'm saying it's from everything that they right. do but as you see that 15 pound increment that's gaining 40 to 50 pounds in high school. And that's the difference between being a terrifically healthy, active, young, beautiful uh, teenager to being someone who's probably very inactive, very, very out of shape, may have body image uh, problems, certainly are, are at higher risk for all of, you know, not just the obesity-related problems, but heart disease, lung disease, all these things that occur mm -hmm. because you're just not exercising. So I'm really, I'm very, very worried about uh, the obesity epidemic. Now, what have we been seeing as trends in our state? Where has okay. it been going? So, in terms of um, physical activity for our youth, because yes. that's really important, and we also need the structure yes. that supports physical activity. Um, and so, for our youth, um, K through 12, mm -hmm. um, there are recommendations for physical activity in the wellness guidelines. Though, um, in middle school, um, middle schools have the option to opt out of providing PE. Mm. Um, so we see that in our data, so that in terms of physical activity for our youth, they're not meeting the physical activity recommendations, and in fact, only about 13% of our high school girls meet the national recommendations for physical activity. What, what is the, how much, ac how much exercise should our teens be getting? They should be getting 60 minutes of moderate um, physical activity a day, and then they should also be adding some vigorous in there, yeah. and um, some weight in there, so um, yeah, they're not meeting it. Our adults are actually doing better. Good. So close to half of our adults are meeting the recommendations mm -hmm. for physical activity, which is 30 minutes a day. Right. Um, so adults are doing better, but for our youth, and you know, when we think about, when you talked about um, just taking in all that um, added calorie and not compensating with physical activity, well, these are the young women who will eventually become our mothers. Right. And so um, there's gonna be more complications um, from pregnancy, but there's also going to be an intergenerational effect. Mm -hmm. So um, there is greater risk for their health and there's greater risk for their families as a result. Right. Um, so we need to build the environment that's going to support their healthy options. You mentioned to me that the counties were doing a pretty good job on building out healthy communities. And yes. why don't you break that down a little bit for us? Okay, so um, several years ago, um, legislature passed the complete streets legislation right. and after that each county in turn passed either a resolution or an ordinance saying we'll work on complete streets which means that every time we touch a road whether it's to build it or to fix it we'll look at accommodating and we will as much as reasonably possible accommodate the pedestrian and the bicyclist right so it's not just moving cars right, right? Um, and so that means that for you and me, when we step out the door, we should have the option, am I going to walk there, bike there, or drive there? Mm -hmm. And every time a development goes into place, we're trying to encourage them mm -hmm. to have walkable communities, 
parks, open spaces, yes. the ability to walk to the grocery store, to walk to yes. the pharmacy or what have you. Yeah, so it's connected. Right. So it's more of a village concept. Yeah. So there's a lot more mixed use um, development happening at the county level. Mm -hmm. And um, we're excited to know that Department of Transportation is also part of that discussion. Right. Um, so we will be seeing more. And so you can see City and County of Honolulu has the bicycle track yes. on King Street. That's all part of that. Mm -hmm. um, Kauai has the long bike bike path. Yes. Um, Big Island's working on the um, is it the King's um, Lane? Yes. So got that going. Maui's also working on Central Maui um, walkability plan. So there's a lot happening at the county level, which is encouraging. Right. Um, we'd like to see more safe routes to school projects. Um, Department of Transportation's making money available to the counties. Safe routes to school looks at well, how can we um, make it easier for our kids to walk or bike to work? Right. So it's not just driving, right? Right. Um, a lot of times um, we build out. Unfortunately, in the past, we've built up roads and made them wider and wider. Um, but it turns out the peak traffic is because parents are driving their kids to school and back. Right. Um, and so. What if instead we put in more sidewalks, um, put in better crosswalks, made it safer, and also gave a sense of safety too? That's important too, the perception of safety as well as the physical safety sure. for kids to be able to walk to so, school. So basically, if we're breaking down the obesity epidemic, we've become less active as mm -hmm. societies. We've added calories galore mm -hmm. um, through empty calories, and we haven't been mindful historically enough of planning. So we're working on the planning. The, uh, the question about activity remains a big one because every time I submit a bill that every kid should have an hour of, of PE, the Department of Education squawks and says, we don't have the time, we don't have the budget. I say you don't have the time or the budget not to do it because you have catastrophic health costs. You should learn your lesson now. Let's build it into the day, this open time, free time, exercise time. And then finally, foods. Okay, you mentioned labeling as a concern. Um, we've looked at the tobacco, uh, sorry, the soda fees or taxes. Um, seems like society's beginning to understand that we have to have this conversation at the very least. Uh, that would have raised, and you know, I, I submitted one of these bills, that raised $38 million yes. that we could have used for, uh, you know, physical education classes, PE classes, that we could have used for walking paths. So people have to decide. I mean, this is a big decision, but I gotta tell you, sooner or later, we're going to pay one way or another. And then what else would you recommend? What are some other initiatives that we ought to be doing on obesity? Okay, so another one um, we worked on is worksite wellness. Yes. Um, so one recommendation was a Department of Health um, and with partners would create like a hub in terms of how do you do worksite wellness. Right. We took the first steps um, in terms of actually now at the state level, the Department of Human Resources in um, October 2014 mm -hmm. passed policies and procedures that encourage worksite wellness at all state agencies. Amazing. So yeah, that was, that was we think, um, former Director Barbara Craig for doing that. Uh -huh. And it encourages then state agencies to set up things like nutrition guidelines and recommendations. So we have one in the Department of Health that we forwarded to our director and we're waiting for approval so that any foods that we purchase that are necessary for meetings and trainings yes. would meet nutrition standards. And then we're doing other things that are really neat too, like school gardens have yes. emerged, trying to get more um, wellness checks for pediatricians to get yes. paid for. When are we going to see major, I don't know if this will work, but like major incentives for people that they have a little business or a department mm -hmm. where if they are able to keep people much healthier and much more active that, for instance, their insurance rates are lower or they get bonuses. Is that emerging as a, a trend? Is that happening anywhere? It is actually happening. And um, some people are building it into their health plans and some people, um, it, it, businesses are providing works at wellness. So we're seeing more okay. evidence of that. Um, and there's um, UHA that's um, got the United, um, the Hawaii Health at Work Alliance. Uh -huh. um, and of course, HMSA has their blue zones. And so there's right. a lot more activity happening in that arena of works at wellness. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up physical exams because I forgot about the bill oh. that would add another physical exam in seventh grade. Right, so we can track BMI. Yes. body mass index, yes. right? And so I think a lot of this is data driven and that's one of the best things about you and your department, which is you have a lot of really smart people and uh, they have the right policy ideas, but we need to be able to show other legislators and show other departments that we have the real numbers here to back it up. And so without some of these exams and whatnot, we just won't have enough data. 
to make our case. Well, the Department of Education is supporting the legislation, so yeah. that's fantastic. Um, and they are concerned about the health of the kids, and so we're working together with them on that. Um, and it will be really important now with the Affordable Care Act. And Hawaii's been ahead, right, with the prepaid act. Yeah. But with ACA, all the well child care exams are covered. Yeah. And so in terms of seventh grade, it's time to see the doctor, you know, and I get their well child care. Okay, well, this has been a fantastic discussion so far. Probably should take a break. Uh, we're at 30 minutes. I'm Josh Green, Healthcare in Hawaii. Today, my guest, Lola Irvin, she's been terrific. She's a leader of the Department of Health in Hawaii. We'll be back in a minute. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator from the Big Island and ER physician. Today I'm talking to Lola Irvin, who's a leader at the Department of Health in Hawaii. She works on prevention and she works on the global health policy questions that we need to embrace here in our state. Welcome back. Thank you. So we talked in our first segment uh, at length about e-cigarettes and the concerns that you have, the policies that we're beginning to put into place. Uh, but you told me that you've had some very interesting conversations with some of the people that sell e-cigs. Tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Um, well, I want to be mindful of privacy. I was um, interested in learning more about why they got into the business. And you know, they are well-intentioned. They got in because they were helping people quit smoking. Yes. What's unfortunately happened in Hawaii is now we have a counterculture happening. People who are using it not just to quit smoking, but because it's the in thing to do. Right. And so that's been a little bit of a downer for some of these folks. And um, they got into it to help people, but to see that there's a subculture is not the reason why they got into the business. Right. Um, you know, people are well intentioned. And um, I want us all to work together. Once we understand in terms of what the data is saying, yes. I think we can group around this one and yeah. agree that it's not good for our health. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because I agree. I, I've talked to a lot of the guys that, that own shops and whatnot. They seem like very good people, mm -hmm. no doubt. Uh, but when push comes to shove, you know, if you're running a small business that's like a gamer store, and they, they're some really terrific guys, but you're going to have younger trending group of people. Adults should make up their own minds what they're going to do right. with their bodies. And we as adults are responsible for our tax base and paying for health care and whatnot. But everyone should remember that we spend $2 billion a year on Medicaid. 360,000 of our individuals in the state are on Medicaid. We pay for all those health care services through, you know, your and my taxes. And if we have higher uh, incidence of whether it's chronic disease from smoking traditional cigarettes, whether we find that there's additional disease from overdoses or use of e-cigs or addiction, we're going to pay for that, just like we're going to pay for people who have high blood pressure and heart attacks and strokes in their 30s or 40s instead of historically 60s or 70s. All of these are going to be consequences that we pay for as a society. So when people go into business, I have to say, be mindful of that. Uh, you said that when e-cigarettes are getting confiscated, at schools, a lot of the times, it's actually the parents that bought them for their youth. Is that right? Well, I don't know about a lot of times, but sometimes they are. So I think we just, I'm glad that we can talk about it because I want parents to know because parents do want the best for their kids. Right. And um, there's been misinformation out there. So we want parents to know these are not healthy. These are not okay for kids. Um, and that while they may be promoted as fun, healthy options, um, we can't recommend them. No, I, I don't really think that any of these chemicals are good for people. And I don't want people to get false hope that they're going to be the, the panacea for smoking traditional cigarettes. It's, 
it's a very addictive chemical, nicotine. Mm -hmm. yes, so it is. everyone out there should be careful not to not to get addicted to anything. Um, I'm not trying to be preachy, just be careful. Now, you've also spent a lot of time on prevention mm -hmm. uh, at Department of Health, and it seems like, uh, based on reading, you know, this report that you brought out, there is a newfound um, commitment to prevention, primary prevention, and kind of health literacy. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? How have things changed? You got into public health now maybe 20 years ago, right? <laughs> so, and now you're looking at it in 2015. How are things different? Okay, um, things are different in terms of 20 years ago, we were building the framework for tobacco. Yes. And now we have it built and, you know, with a 63% reduction in youth smoking and, of course, reduction in um, deaths due to smoking. Yes. Um, people are looking at that and we can all look at that and say, you know what, we can use that framework. Yes. Learn from it for obesity prevention. Got it. So you, you told me once that um, we're finally actually seeing the fruits of this labor, that we're actually for the first time seeing the data where we're having fewer people die of lung cancer, fewer people get diagnosed uh, with these serious diseases. Is that correct or what's going yes, on? Yes, it's exciting. This is the first time that we can say we're trending downward with um, deaths due to lung cancer. So from um, 2001 to 2003, looking at that aggregate three-year data, and then from 2011 to 2013, we've had an 11% reduction in deaths due to lung cancer. It's phenomenal. And you know, cancer is really, really hard um, to reverse. Yeah. And so that's that's just amazing. Yeah, plus lung cancer and pancreatic cancer are two cancers that essentially are gonna kill you. I, it very, very rarely you can find uh, a lung cancer super early and you know, cut it out and people get lucky and live. But too often, mm -hmm game over so I really worry about that and they're talking about people's lives being cut very short when they have their children and grandchildren to love for decades so um, there's nothing good about the you know tobacco industry whatsoever so I don't mind saying that so I'm really pleased you know I'm really pleased that you're seeing those uh -huh. results but that was yeah. because of the model you set up okay. now you're hoping to build a, a lattice work structure on obesity how will that look okay so for obesity um, one we've seen that um, the media campaigns we've done have worked so yes. when we did the rethink your drink um, more than half of the youth said they saw it yes. and then more than 60 percent who saw it said they changed to water Interesting. Um, so we've also seen that policy works. And so since um, the Department of Education implemented the wellness guidelines and um, removed the sugary beverage um, from campus, yes. we've also seen then a reduction in soda consumption for youth. Uh, so we know that policy works. So one, the media environment, school is a great place to work on policy. The wellness guidelines are there. Yes. Um, also, um, the wellness guidelines talk to following the USDA guidelines for food. So we also work with the De Department of Education School Food Services branch to support education because we need then um, to work alongside the school food services managers and employees right. um, with standard recipes that are appealing. Right. It has to be something the kids want to eat. Yes. Um, and they also need the training and we want to support them with that. Um, then there's also the work environment. You talked about the worksite wellness. Um, but also, you know, in terms of worksite, the built environment's really important. So are stairways um, accessible, not just fire escapes, but can people integrate physical activity into their day? Right. Bike share is an exciting program um, that's coming to Honolulu. Oh, good. That yes. the city and county of Honolulu is working on. I saw that. Um, so Imagine being able to have that across all of our counties and being able to fly from island to island, whether it's um, to visit family or for business, and to use the same car that you would here on Oahu to go to Big Island or Maui and use that and grab a bike from the airport and, you know, ride to your auntie's house mm -hmm. or to the hospital. So um, that's another one that's worksite wellness related, but also built environment related. So our environment support being physically active. Yeah. We're also working on farmers markets, having EBT in the farmers markets. That's historically food stamps. Is that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very good too because there's the socioeconomic component where I think that people with less uh, in less means have been victimized over and over and over again by having almost no choice but to buy cheap processed food, which essentially creates obesity. It, there's no way to to say it other than that. But now that you can go whether you're rich or poor, and go to a farmer's market and get fresh vegetables and get fresh fruits and get, you know, home homegrown 
uh, breads and to get our free range chickens and all these healthier foods, it's nice. So we're trying to decrease discrimination by doing that. Right, right. And make it then accessible and available. Right. Uh, Big Island's doing an exciting thing um, with one of the food banks, CSA. So community oh. um, baskets where the locally grown fruits and vegetables are delivered to people and they can use EBT, Amazing. traditional food stamps. And so, you know, in a rural area, agrarian, spread out to have then the food delivered to you and to be able to use EBT then addresses the accessibility and availability issue. It sounds like a total paradigm shift. I mean, this is, it is very interesting and exciting and I hope that we can get out ahead of this, this tidal wave of obesity because really we do have the time in our days. We can find the time, especially when we're young, to get that, you know, hour of exercise. That's totally essential. But to see people eating healthy again makes me happy and you know we have seen the revenues of some of the um, soda companies and some of the processed food companies come down so I'm guessing that all of these public health efforts that you've described are starting to take hold mm -hmm. we have a couple minutes left what would you say the future of public health is for places like Hawaii what do you expect to see in this next decade of public health initiatives what would you like Oh, I would love it um, for all of our agencies to work together. And so it's great, you know, that public health can sit at the table with transportation. Yes. Can sit at the table with land and natural resource folks and to look at, well, the decisions that are made here, how, they, how do they impact our health? Yes. And the options we have daily to sit with Department of Education and to say, what you do academically also in impacts um, the kids in terms of health and how healthy they are also impacts how ready they are to learn. Um, so to sit across the agencies and work together, Department of Human Services, to integrate prevention into the health plans, yes. that's just ideal. And they're looking, for the, the health plans are looking for ways to make a change because they have not seen significant changes in uh, their outcomes for the better. They just, they've tried a lot of creative things. I've had um, executives from HMSA and Kaiser and so on on the show, and they're great people, but they have not seen decreases. They've seen instead increases in obesity, increases in high blood pressure, very expensive health problems, and they're kind of at their um, rope's end. They want to see what can we do, and they're now breaking into um, totally new areas. There's a program called um, AHIA 2020 that HMSA is about to begin to really unveil publicly where they're going to be looking at new and creative ways to integrate uh, lifestyle change, to pay for some of those services in the healthcare community and integrate with Department of Health and like you say, Department of Transportation and Public Safety mm -hmm. and all of these people because at the end of the day, look, we're all in this together. Yes. It's the budgets that are going to be uh, strung together and we're going to have to find resources. There's never enough money to do programs but also people in, in the community, their insurance rates have continued to go yeah. up. They continue to have a hard time finding a healthcare provider because it's not easy to find a doc or a nurse in Hawaii. All of these problems come together, mm -hmm. but it seems like you're advocating a much more holistic view of public health. Just in our last few minutes, uh, do you have any priorities you want to see kind of really hammered home in the next, say, three to six months? What are we looking at for your department? Um, well, for our division work, um, we want to continue being able to put out um, the education pieces out there. The youth actually have created ads that we're, we have on TV, mm -hmm. um, so that's really exciting. They've created their own Rethink Your Drink campaign ads, and we're featuring them. So continue to push out that education. But also, we're, like you said, trying to hold hands with health care, so especially with the community health centers um, and with the health plans, look at the lifestyle management programs mm -hmm. and the disease self-management programs. So once you're diagnosed with hypertension, once you're diagnosed with pre-diabetes or diabetes, how do you manage that outside of the physician's office? Right. Yeah, and that's going to be absolutely essential because going forward, if we don't do that, we're going to continue to see these trends go the wrong direction. We'll continue to see younger and younger crowds of people getting high blood pressure, God forbid, heart attacks, mm. strokes, and then all bets are off. It's very, very difficult to get well. Well, you've been a great uh, guest today. I so appreciate it. Uh, we're going to look forward to more conversations with all of your colleagues, but I hope people take to heart this idea of camaraderie, of integrating the departments, and integrating the conversation. I know that the public health community really wants to see that happen. And in many ways, healthcare is a leader of the economy, yeah. especially here in Hawaii, where we now do $9 billion of aggregate economy around healthcare. 
I hope it'll be wellness health care in the future. Thanks for meeting with me today. Thank you. Thanks, Lola. This has been Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green. Continue to join us on Tuesdays from 2 to 3, where we talk about all the prevalent health care priorities for our state. Thanks again.